Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to YCB sessions. Um, yesterday, we were discussing about the uh, different uh, gurus and uh, lineage which is related to the yoga of Parampara. So, we discussed about the Patanjali Maharshi. Today, we will be going through some other great uh, gurus who are in our yoga lineage. Uh, let me share the screen. Uh, next, uh, Guruji is nothing but uh, the next yoga philosopher is. Maharshi Dayananda Saraswati. So Maharshi Dayananda Saraswati who was a very great sage um, who lived a magnanimous life. That means he has lived a very uh, in a very luxury and comfort, which was an admixture of wisdom, righteous behavior, and yoga. That means he has gained so much knowledge. He always used to have dharmic principles. He used to follow dharmic ways, and he also followed yogic principles. He has glimpse of three channels. So he has uh, gone through Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. And if a person who sees Dayananda Saraswati, he can easily say that he has so much of wisdom. And he does so many actions which are very pure in form. He doesn't expect anything from anyone. And he shows his Bhakti whenever he is speaking with his eyes or with his actions. We can see that Bhakti is reflected from him. That's why he was called as Apta Purusha. Apta Purusha means embodiment of the great yogis, siddhas and sages of all the other gurus. Uh, Apta Purusha is the title given to Maharshi Dayananda Saraswati. He was very selfless. We can't even see a single inch of selfishness in him. He is a karma yogi, disinterested in anything. That means he is not interested to have pleasures. He is not interested to have material wealth. He is not interested to have good food. He used to be disinterested, selfless, and he is the karma yogi. That's why he is also called as Apta Kama. That means he is not having any desire at all. And he is also known as Atma Kama, having desire to attain the Atma. Atma Kama. See, so many titles for him. Apta Purusha, because he is great of all the yogis, siddhas, and sages. And he is Apta Kama, who doesn't have any desire. And he is Atma Kama. He wants to attain the Atma. He wants to see his own Atma. And Akama, he doesn't have no desire. So these are few titles given to him. So if there is a question, who, uh, if there is a multiple choice question, who, uh, who among these gurus are Apta Kama means we need to uh, write the name Maharshi Dhananda Saraswati. And uh, he lived in this world with his yogic energy. That means uh, he attained Samadhi when he wanted to. So when he realized finally that his life was going to end, he went into meditation, singing uh, praises of God, praying, adoring the Supreme Lord, chanting and left his body intentionally. He had conquered death. So he is also known as Mrutunjaya. So uh, what we can say is Maharshi Dayananda Saraswati, he used to lead his life with yogic powers. When he know that, when he came to know that his life is going to end, he himself slowly left his Atma. So that's why we say he has conquered death and he has become Bhutunjaya. He spent all his life in regeneration of the Vedic Dharma and he dedicated all his services to awaken the humanity in the mankind. He always wanted to see good humanity in the mankind. Uh, this is uh, Maharshi Dayananda Saraswati's image. So, Maharshi Dayananda Saraswati's uh, yogic teachings, uh, there are seven principles uh, which we need to know um, the work he has done in yoga, uh, related to our uh, yoga. So, what he used to say is that all the practices of Hatha Yoga, that is Asana, Pranayama, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi, whatever the eight principles of Ashtanga Yoga, and in Hatha Yoga, we know APMN, Asana, Pranayama, Mudra, Nada, Anusangana. All these things are very much necessary to purify the physical body. The first principle he is saying that the practices of Hatha Yoga Kriyas are very much important to purify the physical body. And this aspect he has clearly mentioned and he says that without the strong base, a person can't go for the next step. So the ultimate goal of the yogis is to follow the steps that is whether it is asana, kriya, mudra, pranayama and at the end he needs to submerge oneself into the brahman that is to attain moksha. So that the first principle is he, he is giving uh, he is giving the importance of practicing hatha yoga kriyas. And the second point he is telling is that yoga should not 
uh, a yogi, a person should not think that I should avoid karma. I should avoid doing this action. The misconception, there is a misconception, misconception that, um, see, if, uh, if a work is given to you, uh, you, you might be thinking, if this work, if I am doing good, if it is success, people will applaud me, people will uh, do claps for me. If this work is going wrong, they will start uh, scolding me. They will say that because of me, the work has gone wrong. Instead of uh, waiting for that, uh, exp I, I, I mean, instead of doing this work and getting claps or getting scoldings from them, let me not do the karma. Some people of this, um, some people think in this behavior, why to do that karma? Let me sit uh, silently. It will take on whoever wants to do that activity. They will come and do. So yogi should not avoid doing his karma. We should do our actions. We should do our duty. We should do our responsibility without expecting anything. That is the concept of karma yoga. He also says that just follow your activity just follow your responsibility because you have taken birth into this world the karma should be done but do with wisdom do with knowledge do what is right for you and always while doing karma don't think the result should help you so if i am doing this activity i will give i will get money if i am doing this activity i will get fame so don't think about that expectations but do that karma selflessly that is what our ancestors have also said and he always represented that thing. So whenever he used to do any action, he used to be very selfless. The third point, the spiritual perspective of Maharshi Dayananda Ji is that this world is not reproachable. Reproachable in the sense, we can't create this entire world. This is the creation of the God. We are just, we are just here to experience the actions of the supremacy if we are doing anything if we are reacting for anything if we are doing any response whatever it is this is all possible because of the supremacy you are not responsible for anything don't have the ego that because of you something has happened you should only understand that you are doing each and every action based upon the uh, based upon the script written by the God. This should always be kept in our mind. And the fourth point he emphasizes is that he accepts only few statements of religion which are very logical, truthful and authentic. For example, he always uh, criticized Sati. Okay, Sati was a uh, ancient practice, if you know, in the... Uh, just before the independence at those days, if her husband was uh, died, the lady needs to, uh, she will be also set on fire. So some of the practices he always criticized. So whatever the statements given by either by religion or spiritual, spiritualism or yoga, he used to read those statements. He used to analyze those statements. He used to think the logicality, whether it logically, whether it is true or false, logically, whether it is possible or not whether it is true or not, whether it is authentic or not. So based on universalism, scientific reasons and secularism, he only agreed those statements and contradicted the other which are illogical, which are um, not true. And he accepted only those statements. That means he was away from narrow-minded thinking. So he was away. That, he, that means he contraindicated untouchability. There used to be an untouchability in the earlier days where lower class people were not allowed to come into a house, where they were not allowed to go into the temple. So these kind of things he always avoided. Fraudulence, that is cheating, superstitions, superstitions, that is um, beliefs, categories, different kind of categories in people, sexual differences, hypocrisy, dishonesty. So these are few things he never accepted. He used to think that we are all children of God and God is only true that is Sanatana who has no birth and no death. No death. So he always believed in God and we, he used to think all are equal. So we should be always be equal and treat others also equal. And in the fifth point, he used to say that Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga are not three separate paths. They always flow together and they are always one and the same. It is just the path is different. The person who wants to follow, he would be following. There is no way that one only I should follow one of the path and I will be following only Jnana Yoga. He used to say that in his opinion, all three are not different paths. 
but they always flow together and they will uh, they will merge at one point that is samadhi so once he reaches that samadhi then all these three parts are equal and he also um, we have gone through uh, while we were uh, studying about shaddarsnas and all they were dvaita dvaita vada advaita vada and vishista advaita vada so they, these are the three different sects of uh, dvaita vada so dvaita means two advaita means uh, non duality and vishista advaita means uh, many uh, forms so there was confusion between these three different sects of people sects means one one uh, group of people used to follow dvaita vada one group of people used to believe in advaita vada one group of people they used to follow vishista advaita vada principles he thought that all three are same there should not be any confusion so he established a vada that is known as traita vada traita means three so all these three he united and he said that it is spiritual unity so he established the traita vada and spiritual unity and he said this is how we need to reach god and he also says that to reach god yoga sadhana is important so the, with the practice of yoga sadhana you can reach to the spiritual unity if once the jiva attains the spiritual unity the atma will go and stay with the parmatma that is the ultimate abode which is very pure prudent and blissful state so here uh, he has explained the two states of jiva that is atma jiva has two states one once it takes birth the particular jiva jiva which is present in your body the first state he would experience pleasures he would experience pains he would experience love and hatred whatever a jiva can experience in this world which is maya he would be experiencing once this jiva frees from this world that is once he reaches to the unity that is the traita vada or spiritual unity which is independent of all states it would be blissful the jiva is blissful it can't be returned back there it will stay that is there is no but death cycle Uh, they, that means we, the atma won't be taking again, but the jiva will be merged with the parma jiva or the brahman. And uh, the seventh point he says that he had a great faith in unity, integrity, sovereignty. Along with that means he had he never uh, fighted or uh, he never um, uh, thought only that I should always go in spiritual path. Everyone should uh, listen to my words. He was not in that way. even though he was having a strong base in yogic philosophy he also has knowledge on social reforms political and economic systems that were reflecting the law equality and harmony so um, you might have seen some people they always follow one path that is if they have gone into the spiritual path they are not worried about the world what are the uh, reforms happening over there what is the law system what is the equality and harmony in the outside society but dayananda saraswati he was well equally looking after his own part at the same time with the society that's why we used to say that he has attained godliness he experienced the godliness in all the animate and inanimate entities that means he used to see god in each and every person whether it is a living entity or whether it is a non living entity so this is end of uh, Maharshi Dayananda Saraswati.